Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Um, so the federal workforce is changing a lot. And one of the ways that agencies are trying to kind of accommodate that change is, is looking more towards data to, to you know, plan how their workforce is going to evolve in the coming years. And you know, I just kind of want to start by talking, uh, talking a bit about like, how you guys are approaching that at your respective agencies. Because uh, Jason, I know you kind of represent your at OPM. You kind of represent a lot of the civilian agencies. And Sid, at DHS, you're kind of more in the national security defense space. So if you guys wouldn't mind just starting by kind of introducing yourselves, talking a bit about what you guys do, and we can go from there. Sure thing. Uh, I'm Sid Evans, and uh, I've been with DHS uh, at headquarters and before that at Customs and Border Protection for the last eight and a half years. Before that, spent some time in consulting, and uh, for the previous 26 years as an Air Force manpower officer. And so for those of you who don't, uh, the term manpower, first of all, is number one, sexist, but the number two does not necessarily resonate with human capital practitioners. What it means is, our job, is, our job as manpower people is management of spaces, not faces. So in other words, you know, first being a retired Air Force colonel, I don't like people. So I'll start, I'll start out with that from the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. It's going to go great. Yeah, I'm going yeah. to do, do great. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, you know, some of the things that I heard some of the other speakers talk about uh, this morning really resonate back to my last year in the Air Force. And I see one of my key collaborators uh, in, the, in the audience who uh, worked this, where we looked at a lot of the same sorts of things that we're discussing, the idea of giving people control of their careers, of having portals that allow them to do what they need to do to manage their military finances, manage their records. Uh, dependent uh, arrangements, things like that, you know, with safeguards that made sure that they didn't pay themselves a million dollars. And so it's really good, you know, it's, it's funny because I guess I feel two ways about this. It's good to hear some of the discussion a little bit earlier from the folks from uh, USAID and IRS about developing portals that help automate processes and eliminate job, you know, mind-numbing work that clerks are doing that people can do for themselves. but. Then moving forward to the discussion we just had with OPM, it's also a little bit disappointing that across the federal government, we have everybody basically inventing their own processes when they're all doing the same thing. Now, uh, coming to DHS, like I said, and I, I've been at headquarters now for four years, and you'll know this from my uh, title there, I'm actually in the CFO staff. I was in the Chico staff until uh, October, and they moved my function over there. And uh, by so doing, we recognize a couple of things. First of all, the, the need to integrate human capital, which is 58% of DHS's budget, into the programming process and to ensure that we have linkages between the overall missions and strategies of the department with people and then with what pays them, because it is such a large portion of the budget. But the second thing that became very relevant and part of why I moved from CVP to DHS headquarters was our former secretary had been the general counsel for, for DOD, and he's basically asking questions like, how many vacancies do we have? How many people do we need to have in the future? You know, for example, the executive order, we've got to hire 5,000 Border Patrol agents. Well, it's not appropriate for us to not be able to say, we need 20 at Laredo North, we need 50 you know, of the additional 5,000 by 2024. I'm making that up. The, not the 5,000, not 2024, but Laredo <laughs> North. But at any rate, or we need 50 at San, the support of entry at San Isidro or whatever. Those things, we need to have systems and tools to, to document those things. Compounding our issues in DHS, we were base, we are still basically in an uncomfortable confederation of 22 formerly independent agencies that are broken into, and I see Don from State shaking his head because he used to be there. Uh, but at any rate, uh, that are that are now in nine components. They all nine primary operational components, most from Justice, Treasury, and the Transportation, the part of TSA. They all did things differently, and some of the work that we needed to do to identify what the common practices that needed to be used as our foundation, and then the best practices across, or the unique practices that could be bolt-ons that basic capability were not there. So what we, because of all those influences, 
the Secretary recognized, Secretary Johnson at the time, we needed the Manpower and Organization Program to basically say, you know, if we talk about workforce planning, not the idea that we're doing a good job in workforce planning because we say we need 100, we're losing 10% a year, so we always make sure that we have 100 because we're hiring people to fill those gaps, but instead, is 100 the right number and is it the right number for the future? And I know Jason, I'm going to see a list under because Jason will talk about services they can provide to do things like that. But these are things that, quite frankly, because we had to run the airports in, in DOD, uh, DHS, uh, TSA. <laughs> I get my Ds mixed up all the time. You have 26 years, it's kind of hard to break. But anyway, seriously, um, because you have to run the airports, because you have to run ports of entry, you have mechanistic processes that have flow, that can have workload that can be measured. We had models out there in our components, but what happened was we did not have integration of those where we said, here's an output that says we need, and this is almost the right number, 27,000 uh, CBP officers out in the ports of entry. We didn't then say, okay, here are 27,000 lines in a database that say what those requirements should be today and in the future so that we could actually use that to inform budget and human capital planning. Uh, I don't know how we want how we want to do this structurally because I don't want to steal all of Jason's thunder, <laughs> but I do have a couple of vis aids which are available as well. You know, paid political announcements. So I don't know if you want me to show that or if you want to. But sure. Well, uh, well, let's first shift to Jason, <laughs> and then we can uh, we can go from there. Sure. Well, uh, I'm Jason. I'm from OPM, and I'm actually from the uh, the place that Deputy Director Riga spoke about just a few minutes ago. I work in our HR Solutions Division, and for the last 23 and change years, uh, I've been uh, I've been helping agencies on the ground uh, get better. I ran our staffing uh, business for a long time, and now I run our HR strategy business, which is like everything except staffing. So, uh, uh, which includes workforce planning, succession planning, position classification, performance management, all that stuff. Uh, that goes so well for all of you in agencies every day. Um, so uh, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really quite interesting. Uh, most of my job these days, uh, we've always been in the restructuring business, helping agencies uh, maybe look differently and look better to meet their missions. Uh, but the, uh, the concept of using data has become really front and center uh, the last few years. Uh, since the dawn of time, uh, workforce planning in agencies was done very simply. Uh, step one, get money. Step two, divide said money by the cost per number of people. And step three, hire that many people. There, there ain't even a step four. That was it. And uh, with the exception of places like DOD, been actually doing a, a very good job uh, for a long time. But that was it. Um, the, uh, the data you got was, was just that. You didn't get to ask for anything else. Um, usually you had a gut feeling of how many people it was going to take to do some work, and sometimes that gut feeling was augmented by the amount of dollars available. Um, those were... Well, yeah, two years in advance. You have to project that, you know, using uh, all of those sophisticated forecasting tools we had back then. Um, but here's what we've seen in the last, um, uh, really the last few years. And um, as, as society has gone, so has the, uh, the federal government and the, uh, the decision making around things like uh, manpower, workforce planning, and things like that. Um, uh, if, I wanted a, uh, if I wanted a new tie, I would pull out my phone, I would have immediate global access to a wealth of relevant data that's been curated for me. I'd be able to look at reviews I trusted and didn't trust, and I'd be able to make a more educated decision on what kind of tie I would get, where it would come from, how long it would take to get there, and I would find the one that best met all of my criteria within a matter of about 30 to 45 seconds, instantly. What we're finding out in agencies is that uh, subconsciously or explicitly, we want to be able to make good decisions better and we want access to better data that we think and in some cases know is there. And it's not just agency leadership that is, uh, that is uh, kind of fueling this appetite, uh, it's also Congress. Um, gone are the days when, uh, when you can say, hey, we did a bad job on this this year, you need to give us more money so we can do a good job next year. Um, there are going to be questions. There are going to be questions that require data to give answers. So what we're working with many of our agency clients to do is to tap the data they have now to use that data in more appropriate ways and to be able to deliver that data more quickly and in more relevant terms so that that will inform things like how many people do I need to do this job? It's the fundamental question, right? And surprisingly or not surprisingly, that question doesn't get answered 
with a lot of data in many places, but we're helping change that. Many agencies have, uh, uh, have realized this and they're doing a much better job at that. Uh, it's an exciting time uh, in terms of data with the availability, uh, some of the tools that are there now and some of the work uh, that's being done out there in agencies. Oh, for sure, for sure. So just to dig in on that a little more. So you said that you know, there's a lot of interest in agencies now in, in using data to kind of plan their workforce. Um, I'm curious what some of the bigger challenges you've run into when you're trying to help agencies kind of take advantage of the data at their fingertips. Like, is that, does that data contain enough insight uh, you know, for, for top level leaders on kind of where there might be gaps in the workforce, that kind of thing? Are there any other you know, organizational data challenges that um, you guys have run into in kind of rolling out those tools? Yeah, absolutely. So the 472 page report contains plenty of insight and data sure. that top <laughs> leaders can use to action. Um, Right? <laughs> uh, right? I mean, that, yes, we absolutely have that data. We have every potential data field you might need to make a decision, and we're going to deliver that in a 472-page report with one graph at the back that, uh, that basically is a reverse table of contents. Well, so, so instead of that, um, sure. agencies and, uh, um, and, and OPM's um, you know, consulting arm, we're starting to, to ask the questions, okay, what's the decision you're trying to make? What's the kind of activity you need to completely um, you know, transform or undertake on a recurring basis? What data do you have to support that decision? How can we make that an easily digestible, maybe even a compelling mm -hmm. uh, presentation so that you can have the data you need and only the data you need to make that decision? Um, and, and we're finding some success with that. Um, I mean, uh, again, I'm not going to look at 472 reviews for my, for my new tie on, a, on any, anywhere. I'm not going to look at that. But I am going to look at um, three or five reviews I trust. And, and really, so uh, an agency structure decision, when you're looking at how you should structure a, a subcomponent or the number of people you need to, uh, a number and type of people, are you, going to, uh, are you going to outsource a particular aspect of that? All of those decisions, um, there's data there in the agencies to support that. There's, there's historical data, there's forward-looking data in many cases that just hasn't been used in that case. But the, the trick is to, uh, to present that data to decision makers with context and in an easily digestible and, and compelling way. Not to influence the decision, but to, I'm, I'm from Kansas City and, and you gotta show me, right? You know, we're from the show me <laughs> state. And so, but I don't want you to show me 472 pages of data um, uh, try as we might, uh, we're never going to be led by data scientists in the federal government. We're going right. to be led by leaders that make decisions and they want to make those decisions based on, uh, based on compelling but succinct data points. So that's really where uh, a good deal of our work is falling these days. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, Sid, if you want to... Yes, yeah, so if you cue the visual aid real quickly. Yeah. Uh, compel this is compelling, maybe not that succinct. Uh, Let's see if we'll get this up here. And in fact, I'm gonna get off the, uh, here we go. So this is our theoretical construct of what manpower and organization means. And you know, off to the right side is what, I call it personnel, because I'm an Air Force guy and I'm used to calling it personnel in DOD. But human resource is basically a system that makes sure we hire people, we sustain them, and we transition them to get the right person in the right place at the right time doing the right things. Uh, and uh, once again, the first two slides I'm going to show, because the next one's a severe eye test. I have a, I need a microphone that doesn't crackle, right? That's a good one. Okay. Thank you. Maybe it's me. Okay. Uh, but, but anyway, so the motherhood and apple pie stuff is off to the left. That you know, the organizational vision, mission, strategy, and environment drive your missions. From the missions, you develop specific goals and objectives. Now, here's where manpower comes in. And you'll notice I have a continua continuum here, by the way. Here's the foundation of human capital requirements. The integration of certain data inputs, analysis, which is what Jason was talking about, about having models and tools to determine requirements, and then documentation. In other words, something that says this is how many people we need to execute that mission. And both today and, well, first of all, requirements determination, you know, good case in point. Let's say at Dulles Airport, there are 600 TSOs, and we determine that they're going to add 20 gates to Dulles in five years. Well, that should mean that you know, we do the math and we can determine we need 100 more TSOs in Dulles. The key is that if you're a human capital practitioner, 
you should not have to wait until somebody gives your request for personnel action and say, give me 100 more TSOs at Dulles. You ought to have some sort of system of record that says, hey, looks like you need 100 more TSOs in Dulles in three years. What do we need to do to help you get there in terms of hiring people, training people, you know, the uh, facilities folks, helping out with any facility needs you have, all the holistic assets that go into supporting the mission should be uh, sh you should have tools available to help you plan for those. So, you know, the, the example here, yeah, I mentioned Dulles. That's, I mean, that's not an exact real scenario, but TSA, for example, has models that look, look at aircraft loading. They look at aircraft schedules. They look at airport configuration. And they have thousands of different variables that they plug in and each airport updates that then says, this is how many people we need to keep the transportation secure, uh, system secure. CBP, same, the same way with ports of entry. You know, the CBP officers, they're the dark blue suitors if you fly internationally. You know, they're the ones who are checking documents when you come in for an international flight. We also have people at seaports who are checking containers. All those processes, because you have something you can measure, can then be translated into personnel requirements. When you do that, that provides a foundation for this, a table of organization. You notice the green versus orange, what we're saying here is, okay, we say we need 28,000, but right now we only have enough money to pay for 25,000 because of fiscal constraints. So we don't lose sight of that extra 2,000 because it's still been validated as a requirement. So we don't say, well, we can't hire it, so we're gonna sweep it off the books. You still gotta have it there. And you gotta have the discipline to, to keep it up to date, and that's some of the processes that we are putting in place in DO, uh, there I go again, DHS. Okay, next slide. Uh, so, do you have a way you can zoom this by chance? Okay, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> now, our payroll, our payroll provider is USDA NFC. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. I guess I will do it here. Our payroll provider is USDA NFC. Everything we have here in black are some of the fields that we track or that we pull out of NFC to make sure we understand the capability that the people who do the work perform. You'll see there, you know, the pay period, end date, agency code, personal office identifier, org code, pay uh, plan, series grade, master record number, which is most of you know is simply uh, position description number, individual position number, et cetera, et cetera. When the position was established, whether it's FLASA, whether it's union. But what was not in NFC was a good, assured, friendly way to document positions. You know, it can, you can go in there, you can find good old Sid, and 207,000 of his closest friends, but you can't find in NFC the 246,000 people who we have identified are required based on models. So, and on top of that, we cannot, number one, document the financial aspects that pay for a position, because that, believe it or not, was not built into a system produced by the National Finance Center. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, I mentioned models, so we have the model ID, we have the FAIR Act function code and reason code. You know, every year we gotta do the FAIR Act, goes to OMB, nobody does anything with it, but it's there. So what we recognize we needed to do in creating positions in tra is to track some of these things, have our components keep them up to date, so when it's time to flip the switch to send the report to OMB, you know, we check it real quick for one month, we make whatever changes need to be made, we send it off to OMB, and, we, and this is data that governs our behaviors. Now, all the things you see here with the lines, uh, because there's so much position stuff, all this purple stuff we have here are other things we, that are not in NFC that we are building a virtual database that is linked by position number so that you can see documentation, mission critical positions, acquisition workforce, you know, whether somebody's a program manager or life cycle logistician or whatever, or whether, whether there is a requirement for that acquisition level, whether a person in the job wears a uniform, is expected to wear a uniform. You know, as an example, we talked about classification a few seconds ago. Well, again, as Don knows, we have 43 different ways to say 1801 in DHS. Some dress like this, some wear in uniforms. And so it's very critical so we can figure out how much money we gotta spend on uniforms to know who actually needs to wear one. What positions carry weapons? whether a position is funded or is unfunded. Lots of things are not in NSC that we are now building. Now, what you'll notice from the colors is that when it was me and two other guys, we were doing all this, uh, we were basically triaging what we needed to do, the PPA, Requirements ID, FAIR Act, to basically show some quick wins. 
Now the other things that are in purple here, we are trying to do, now my SAS has expanded, to mature the capability to build the case, you know, to build the case for change so that Sid can build his empire even bigger, you know, from 11 people to, you know, 14,000. But, uh, but seriously, to provide capabilities that really help the department manage its resources more effectively. And then what happens is we link some of these common keys to what we have in the budget system and what we have in the organizational system. And you know, one of the things I'll tell you real quickly is kind of funny about databases. So when it goes to GSA, fix this. But uh, for example, whether positions in, in the field or in headquarters, you know, there's two things. There's an organizational record, there's a position record. Where would you think headquarters field would be in NFC? On the organization or on a position? It's not, it's on position. <laughs> Don't ask me why. So uh, we're looking to get that straight as well, to supplement NFC data, and also to do things like organization code. So you can see who somebody works for by just an office symbol, which I think GSA and some others use. And if it's a seven-digit you know, seven org code because you know, it's way down the food chain, get something from them, they can blow, you can blow it off. Get something with three digits, you pay attention. Right. That was a joke. Awesome. Uh, Sid, if I, could, if I could just jump in real quick. There's, I'm, there's, I'm just having No, you're having a good time. I'm having a good time. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, let me show you one last thing. I'll, I'll, I'll go forward. So what this does is it yields for us then, uh, next slide. Now this is sanitized data, but it allows us to see how many FTEs are authorized based on the budget, how many positions are authorized, because they're two different things, how many positions we have on the database, how many people are on board, and how many FTEs that we have executed. So we can get an idea of what we're allowed to do, who we got, and how much money they have cost us. Something we could not do as a department, and it's all a matter of taking data that we, for the most part, already have and linking it together. Now. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, so I have a couple questions that, oh. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. So I have a couple questions I want to get to before we open it up for the audience. Um, so one of the things that, that you guys are using data for as well is kind of not only figuring out where you need to direct employees now, what some of the, gap, the current gaps are, but projecting where there might be increased demand for skills you know, in the years ahead. Um, so if you guys could just talk a bit about how like, you guys are kind of approaching that at you know, OPM, DHS, um, and then what some of those, those future jobs that might see kind of growing demand over the next decade or so it might be. Yeah, absolutely. So um, with a lot of our agency clients right now, um, the, the process begins by, uh, uh, by, so there are, organizations are collections of humans. This should not surprise anyone in the room, I don't think so. And those human beings um, have to go through a change process and a decision-making process when, when you're gonna make big changes. So uh, what we found is uh, um, we, we've kind of nailed the, uh, the data analysis, uh, some of the forward-looking data. Um, we can do a, um, you know, we can do an environment mapping uh, exercise with these, you know, all, all manner of those visioning, four worlds, blah, 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 those kinds of things to help agencies um, figure out where they're going. Uh, often, that's in conjunction with working with uh, agency leadership uh, to do a, a take on, you know, what must we do, what should we do in the future, what might we right. do if we had the opportunity in the future. Helping those agency leaders uh, prioritize what they're going to do, what changes they need to make, what activities they're going to prosecute, and then we can start to assign the, um, the data models and things like that toward how many and what type and where and in what footprint and things like that um, it might take to get there. Um, uh, one uh, recent example is with the National Nuclear Security Administration. We actually worked with them uh, on a nationwide basis um, to, to really help answer the question, given what we've been told by Congress we're going to do in the next five to 10 years, given what we've seen in our budget environment, and given what resources we have now and what we might we might need in the future, how should we organize, where should we be, how many people, and so, and, uh, and actually our, our analysis work from, from OPM was used, they used that in their, in their budget discussions with the Hill, and I'm, I'm pleased to say it was compelling and they got what they needed because, because we had real data and we had real answers to, to very good questions on why should we give you this money. Um, what I will say is, uh, uh, and, and what we're finding is uh, uh, particularly interesting, is um, the, the science around data and the science around the use of data is not progressing as quickly as the use of data, if that makes sense. A um, lot of data, a lot of people using it, and a lot of people using it, not in nefarious, but questionably accurate ways, right? Uh, I saw, the, uh, I saw uh, just on Medium this morning uh, that you have a 20% increased risk of cancer if you eat bacon three times a day or something like that. Well, that's true in terms of relative risk. 
And in terms of absolute risk, it goes from point zero. That guy's worried about this. He's like, <laughs> God, somebody take the bacon off the counter over there. That's right. Um, but in terms of absolute risk, it goes from 0.04% to 0.06%. So four out of 1,000 people versus six out of 1,000. Those are two very different stories using the same data. And so uh, what we tend to find is, and, and data is, is great for, for using to the, the end you, you know, want. And so we're, um, we're finding ourselves in both a client service role and uh, a good government role. Like we want, the, just like Sid put up with that very extensive uh, um, kind of data set, we're trying to align data in the government so that we can answer the same questions with the same data and get answers that are transferable across government. It's, uh, um, and as, as an OPM employee and as uh, Deputy Director Regas talked about our, our, um, our work with GSA in the future, we're actually excited about that because when we work with agencies, we've got things like the structure, the processes, the number of people, the type of people. Um, we know how to do that, we're really good at that, uh, and we can make agencies better. But often there are things like, what kind of space should we be in? How much space should we have? How much uh, skiff space do we need because we have this kind of work? And those are questions that GSA does a really good job answering. So we're actually very excited about the, the, the future of an OPM-GSA uh, partnership because right now we're the, we're the people people and GSA are the places and things people. And if you can put places, things, and people all together, that guy just made a jingle in the third row there. He's <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, but if we can do that and, and do that well, then I think we can really get some traction around that. So it's a couple answers, one to your question and one not. But oh, certainly, yeah. certainly. Um, so last thing before I might, we might have time for like one or two audience questions. Um, so as you guys are using that and you're trying to kind of like get people to understand the difference between you know presenting something that's you know a point four percent to a point six percent increase, like. As you're using more data in the kind of HR and hiring process, um, I imagine you're going to need to build um, data savvy within you know yeah. HR offices kind of across government. So, um, if you guys could speak to that a little bit, just like kind of where where do your agencies stand as it relates to that, and um, you know where we where do we need to head? Absolutely, and you know that's again the last slide I showed shows some of the integration of data that we're starting to communicate in the functional communities across the department is, and especially of course in the human capital and financial communities to show how all these things fit together and to show how it ties together with money which is obviously the true no pun intended coin of the realm and so we we've, we had a lot of success and a big part of it has just been making the case for change having senior leadership ask questions about what's your vacancy rate how do you know it's right what do you forecast in the future? They say, oh, we better call SIDS guys and see what, what their tools say. So it's a lot of just, again, having quick wins to show the value of the investment of pulling all this stuff together. Yeah, and in terms of the types of hires, to, mm -hmm. to go back to your, your previous question, um, data science and data scientists are sneaking in everywhere, and, and they should be. Uh, because um, because the, the the appropriate use of data and the uh, the robust use of the data we have available becomes more and more important in every aspect of, of what we're doing in operations in facilities in HR all of that so so because uh, often when agencies can't answer these questions they, they call me um, yeah. we've started to uh, to get real intentional about getting data savvy folks uh, that that use this as a matter of course when we're working with agencies so if they can't uh, if they can't maybe develop Develop that capacity in-house to start. They lease it from us. Mm. We teach them to fish. We help them get the right kind of employee in the door, and then they can go on and and, and do that themselves. So we are seeing. Um, I don't know if I would call it a burgeoning, but I would call it a uh, an incrementally increasing recognition and uh, and emphasis on bringing data science and data scientists into a variety of places in government. And I think that's a I think that's a good thing. I think it can. Uh, we we've always had the data, and we continue to get more and more data but we haven't always been great at, at using that in a meaningful way. For sure, well I'm excited to see how you guys uh, kind of evolve with that. Me too, man, um, so it's I never boring. <laughs> so I think we have time for uh, one audience question if, um, if anyone has any. Uh, oh, uh, we'll go back here. <laughs> Hi. Good morning, or, sorry about that. Rich Cardenas with the VA. Um, 
Look, I'm a former OSD uh, manpower guy myself, and so uh, I was really interested in what you put up there. Uh, our manpower shop just stood up here about uh, two years ago. Uh, as you are well aware, and as uh, some others, uh, manpower people I, I've met in here are aware, uh, uh, DMDC pretty much ca captured all of the manpower data. Um, that's the Defense Manpower uh, Data Center in Monterey, California, for all of uh, uh, o uh, OSD, all the services. Uh, and basically, you know, vetted all that information uh, through a series of reports and stuff. What, if any, do we have from a uh, civilian personnel in terms of a data warehouse uh, where we can go where the data is actually quantified and qualified uh, as accurate uh, to be able to be used as a, uh, as a standpoint? Yeah, that's the question, isn't it? So if I were to ask Sid, Sid, uh, very simple thing. Um, I just want a, uh, a clean set of data, and I want to redo my org charts every t uh, every pay period. Um, you know, all I need is uh, all I need is employee ID reports to maybe an org code. I want to put a picture on there. That's real easy in that 156 yes, uh, things, right? We, well, actually, it is if you you know if you have the data structures built properly. Ah, thank yeah. you for caveating that, Sid, because yes. because we get to the answer right That's there, right? right? Mm -hmm. Because Sid is on top of this. And he's put things into his data set that make that easy. Many agencies in the government and some of our core infrastructure can't even supply the most basic position and reports to information so that you can just, seems so simple, right? I need an org chart. Oh God, not an org chart, <laughs> right? There are people out here that have had to do this, right? There are consultants out here that made a lot of money and spent a lot of weeks doing this. But the, the point is, we're, we're not quite there yet. The central personnel database uh, that OPM houses is, is, is close, but it's not there. The Enterprise Human Resources Initiative and the EOPF is, is a step in the right direction. But there are, uh, there are a whole lot of talks in place, and, and, and this should come together uh, in, the, in the next you know, year or two between OPM and OMB and GSA. We, we are really working on getting that data warehouse, that clean data set, and finally getting towards some data alignment and data standardization across the government, because then, I mean, it's, that's, a, that's a quantum leap forward in our ability to make decisions. And, and we're, we're working hard on that. We're not, we don't have it, I can't turn it on yet, but we're working on it. And I see a blinking red light, so I'll make this real quick. But see, a challenge is that most of us in the human capital practice have looked at our role as being personnel management, not requirements management. As one of my colleagues often says, he says that so often we establish positions and we treat them as a vehicle to hire and pay people, not something that represents uh, the ability to perform a mission and to meet a requirement. And even with OPM, you, know, you have your CPDF, Central Personnel Data File. There's not a CMDF a central manpower data file, which then says, okay, here are those two million people. Now here are, as we see it, 200,000 validated requirements somewhere that have not been filled. We're gonna be, at, we're still not perfect. We're probably 80% there in DHS, and we've been working on it for uh, five years, like someone was saying earlier as well, but you know, we're making tremendous progress. Awesome. Well, that's all the time we have, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.